Welcome to part five of the Seven Years' War. Now we're going to take a look at the war's end and aftermath. After the fall of Quebec, there's really nothing to stop the British from just dominating uh, the North American uh, battlefield, right? For example, in September of 1760, a year after the fall of Quebec, you're going to have Montreal fall. And in this case, uh, the British are going to attack Montreal. They're going to lose, right? But the situation of logistics and, and supply with the uh, French troops are just so bad, they have to abandon the city, right? Uh, the Marquis de Vaudreuil is going to replace the Marquis de Montcalm. Remember, he was killed at the Battle of, of uh, Quebec. And uh, in 1760, in, uh, he is going to surrender all of Canada to the British, right? Uh, he's going to declare New France um, uh, surrendered to Great Britain. Even Detroit will be captured, right? On the 29th of November, 1760, British troops are going to march into Detroit and capture it without firing a single shot. So you can just see the, the dominoes now are falling in rapid succession. So the British are going to achieve a total victory here in North America. And when we look at it, it's pretty easy to see why. I mean, first of all, that attrition and supply, the logistics things, right? The, the uh, logistical situation for the French made it really impossible for them to win. They couldn't maintain the uh, supply lines for their troops. They couldn't uh, deal with a large amount of attrition where the British had the ability to do that, right? Secondly, the British had made the decision, they'd made the choice that they were going to spend the capital and resources to win in North America, right? The French were not as committed in doing that, right? The North American continent, at least, was not extremely valuable for them. New France was not generating a plethora of wealth for them not like they're like say for example by contrast their caribbean island ho holdings and their sugar plantations which were actually pretty profitable and pretty cheap to maintain right well add to that the royal navy the royal navy uh, had the capabilities of completely blockading access to new france right uh, the saint lawrence river and elsewhere right making it very difficult for the French to resupply, re-equip, and replace its men, right? And then finally, of course, once the French had decided to give up on their Native American allies, that pretty much made it impossible because they lost that resource as well, right? And matter of fact, the Native Americans began to turn on the French in many cases because, well, like I said, they were interested in the war for their own aims, their own goals, and when they were being excluded out from us, well, okay, fine, what's the point then? We will maybe look around and shop around our, our services elsewhere, i.e. the British. So the war was officially over with the signing of the Treaty of Paris of 1763, okay? Now, those that know me know that I often tell them, don't go crazy trying to memorize exact dates. Remember, dates are all ar arbitrary. You know, if you ever want to see an example of that, take a look at when the uh, October Revolution in Russia took place, you know, leading to the rise of Bolshevism. Uh, it, it took place in November, right? But they were on a different calendar, for, so for them it was still October. Um, but in this case, you're going to need to remember the year or at least know what the treaty is about, right? The Treaty of Paris of 1763. Why? Well, there are, as far as I know of, 33 treaties of Paris. All right, that's how many the last time I counted. Um, who knows if I missed some in the process of doing that. 33 treaties of Paris, right? So if you just say Treaty of Paris, which Treaty of Paris? In this class, in this first half US history class, we will talk about two treaties of Paris. The Treaty of Paris of 1763, which I'm about to talk I'm about to talk about now, and the Treaty of Paris of 1783, exactly 20 years later, so that makes the numbering even harder to remember, that ends the American Revolution. So they're both really important. Okay. Um, so in this case, just remember either the Treaty of Paris of 1763 or the Treaty of Paris that ended the Seven Years' War, so that you can definitely distinguish between the different ones. By the way, why are there so many treaties of Paris? Because they were negotiated there. And if you've ever been to Paris, you'll understand why. Paris is awesome. It's a great place. I'd go there to negotiate a treaty. 
I would not go to Alamogordo, New Mexico to negotiate a treaty. You'd never get me there. Anyways, so what comes out of this? What comes out of the Treaty of Paris of 1763, first of all, is that England is going to gain a lot of land. They're going to gain all the La Salle claim east of the Mississippi River, right? And they're going to gain Florida. Well, Florida belonged to Spain. Well, what happened here was this. Remember, Spain got involved really late in the war, 1762. And the British were very punitive to them. They helped the Portuguese uh, resist the invasion attempts by the Spanish. They conquered all the island of Cuba. And they also conquered the silver city of Manila in the Philippines. Right. Um, Spain really wants Cuba back. And so Britain tells them, says, OK, fine, we'll give us Florida. Spain's like, oh, I really kind of want Florida, too. It says, hey, man, make a choice. You can either give us Florida or we're keeping Cuba. And they decided that they wanted Cuba more than they wanted Florida. Sorry, Floridians. Right. And so they made that exchange. So England gains the LaSalle claim east of the Mississippi River in all of Florida. That's a lot of land they suddenly gain. Spain loses a lot, right? They lose Florida to get Cuba back. But they do gain the western half of the Louisiana territory, right? The LaSalle claim. Why is that? Well, honestly, the French felt pretty terrible about the fact that they had goaded Spain into this war so late and they had lost so much in such a short period of time. And so this is kind of a way of saying, hey, we're sorry about that. Here, you, we know you lost Florida. We know you really wanted to keep it. Here, have Western Louisiana, which is kind of the equivalent of getting socks for Christmas, right? One of the things about the French and New France was that it wasn't very profitable. And that Western half of the LaSalle claim was really just, I mean, as far as the French were concerned, it was a wasteland. There wasn't anything to be gained there. Now they just gave it over to Spain. Now, Spain, by this point, controls everything up through modern-day Texas, right? Um, and they consider Texas a wasteland. I know when we look around here in Texas, we're like, what are you talking about? But to them, there's no major uh, Native American empires to conquer. There's no gold, and so therefore it's a wasteland. They struggle to get people to come to Texas. This is why eventually you're going to have the impresarios, right? Now you just got Louisiana, too. That's just more wasteland. See what I mean? It's like getting socks for Christmas. Spain's like... Here, or France is like, here, here's West Florida. And Spain's like, ah, oh, thanks. Socks, right? That's kind of the attitude I'm sure that they had towards it. Now, France is out of the North American continent entirely, which actually for them is helpful. Like I mentioned before, a lot of this Louisiana territory is absolutely worthless to them. So they're out of there, but they maintained their more profitable and easier to maintain sugar plantations in the Caribbean. So they kind of made out there, right? But it makes the Native Americans the biggest losers. Because the only European nation that truly could at least be considered closest to an ally to the Native Americans were the French. They were the ones that were at least most amiable to them. You know, the Spanish, it was all about, you know, we want you to convert to Catholicism. And the English, it was all about, you can have this land until we want it, right? And then your choices are relocation or extermination. So as you can see, it's, you know, losing the French allies is a pretty big thing for the Native Americans. Now, the last point that we need to make here that's really important because it's going to play into the next topic is that the result of this, because Great Britain had made the commitment to spend the capital to win the war, they had acquired a tremendous amount of debt during this war. Wars are expensive. That's just a truism. And they needed to find some way to pay this debt off. Now, needless to say, since the colonies were standing to be the greatest benefactor of this war, it only made sense that they should bear their fair share their fair burden of this debt, right? And so as a result, the British are going to start trying to come up with ways to spread the tax burden around to include the colonies, and it's going to cause the next colonial crisis.